Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Well, good evening, everybody. And um, again, thank you for coming out this evening to, um, to, to hear this series of lectures tonight. Uh, my name is Sherry Mizumori, and I'm chair of the psychology department, and I'm honored to be able to welcome you to the fourth annual Edwards Public Lecture Series. Now, the second speaker in tonight's um, series is Dr. Karen Emery from San Diego State University. Now, Karen Emery received her PhD in linguistics from UCLA in 1987, and she was a senior staff scientist at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences from 1988 to 2005. And during that time, she was an associate director of the Laboratory for Cognitive Neuroscience. She is currently a professor in the School of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences, as well as um, director for the Laboratory for Language and Cognitive Neuroscience at San Diego State University. Now, Dr. Emery has received consistent, again, support from the National Institutes of Health and also the National Science Foundation over the years, and she's published just cutting-edge research, new findings in top journals, and for these findings have helped us to understand the role of memory and brain organization in the use of English as well as ASL, American Sign Language. She is very highly regarded in the field as uh, she has served on a number of editorial boards for journals. Her work has received some me um, good media attention, and she has written a number of wonderful books on language and signing. And so with that, let's welcome Dr. Karen Emery. So thank you very much. It's just wonderful um, to be here. And what I'd like to start with is um, a little bit of a pitch for sign language research. So the discovery that sign languages are natural human languages has had an impact on a number of scientific fields. So one is uh, linguistics. One of the questions that linguists try to answer is, what is universal to all human languages? Well, the fact that um, sign languages have been legitimized as an um, OK domain of research to, to um, ask these questions to try to find out what's the same across all human languages. We now have this really exciting domain of looking cross-linguistically at a number of different sign languages around the world. Uh, this has actually led to the discovery of um, new sign languages within the last decade. So we can really see what's universal to all human languages by looking at both signed and spoken languages. In addition, by looking at sign languages, you can identify what aspects of language are affected by the characteristics of audition versus vision. So for example, um, the auditory system is very good at um, processing very fast temporal changes on the order of 40 milliseconds. Um, and this allows spoken languages to have multi-segmental words. You can have a lot of different sounds in a word. And in addition, the jaw moves up and down, which um, allows for um, a type of syllable frame to, to um, organize these segments within a word. Now, in contrast, sign languages use not a single um, oscillator, a jaw, but two independent articulators. And the hands are much slower than the tongue. And Richard Myers recently argued that uh, the fact of these differences in biology leads to um, a syllable structure for spoken languages that allows spoken languages to create um, a structure with many segments within a word, whereas 
Um, there isn't any kind of parallel in sign language, a parallel type of organizing structure based on the syllable. So these are biological differences based on audition and vision that give rise to differences between spoken and sign languages. We can also see what aspects of language are shaped by the nature of the oral versus manual articulators. Uh, so this is what I was saying about um, the um, manual articulators being slower, the um, oral articulators being faster. Um, so we see this difference in both perception and production that gives rise to different changes in the structure. So in um, spoken languages, you can have a number of, of different um, sounds that go together to make um, prefixes and suffixes to create a linear structure within the spoken word. Whereas sign languages tend to layer their structure. So you tend to have verb uh, movements layered on top of verb stems. So you have motions, you have facial expressions that are occurring simultaneously. The visual system is very good at taking in that kind of information. So you get a more simultaneous structure for sign languages and a more linear structure for spoken languages. Within psychology, the study of sign languages and the deaf and hearing people that use them, we can start to look at how language interacts with cognition. We can look at uh, what is the effect of knowing a visual spatial language on non-linguistic aspects of cognition. So there's been some interesting studies looking at visual spatial, spatial abilities in hearing and deaf signers um, and compared to non-signers, both hearing and deaf. And we see that um, both hearing and deaf signers have enhanced mental imagery abilities. We see that they're faster at doing mental rotation tasks, they're faster at doing image generation tasks. We also see some evidence that they have uh, larger um, spatial memory spans. And these abilities seem to be linked specifically to some of the visual imagery um, requirements that you see in sign language processing. So visual imagery that you use in narratives and in spatial descriptions. There seems to be a link between visual imagery and sign language use and enhancements in non-linguistic visual imagery abilities. So it's a, again, it's a nice domain where you can look at how um, a language can affect cognition in a way that you can't really do with spoken language. And finally, what we're going to talk about today is looking at cognitive neuroscience and what sign languages can tell us about, um, in particular, what might, what might be the factors that determine brain organization for language. So you've seen already that there are these important areas that have been identified for uh, language, for, based on spoken language. So we see Broca's area um, has been identified as being important for speech production, and Wernicke's area has been important for speech comprehension. And there are, these regions are also connected to each other. The frontal area of the brain is connected to the posterior area of the brain through white matter tracts. So the speech production system is talking to the speech comprehension system. Now, as um, uh, Dr. Osterhout was telling you, um, it's interesting that the area that's important for speech production is just in front of the area that controls um, the uh, sensory motor aspects of the face, the tongue, the vocal tract. And we also see Wernicke's area right next to the auditory regions for speech comprehension. Now, sign languages allow us to look at um, whether this organization might be determined by the input-output nature of speech, of spoken language. So um, we can look at um, sign languages where we have a different set of motor articulators. You're using the hands rather than uh, the face to produce the language. And also we have you're um, perceiving the language visually, not auditorily. And the visual area of the brain is quite far from the auditory area of the brain. So we can see what happens with um, sign languages. Do we see these same areas engaged in comprehension and production? So the first thing we're going to look at is language output. And we're going to look at um, whether or not we see um, Broca's area, or this frontal area of the brain, engaged in both sign production and in word production to a similar extent. And the study that I'm going to tell you about looked at um, word production and sign production in native deaf ASL signers compared to hearing English speakers. 
Now, one of the things I want to tell you about um, the participants who are in this study, all of the studies I'm going to tell you about today that look at deaf signers, look at deaf native signers. That is, deaf people who um, acquire ASL um, from birth from their deaf parents. So these are um, uh, people born into deaf families. Their parents start signing to them from infancy. We want to compare this group of signers to our um, hearing um, speakers, because of course hearing speakers are exposed to spoken language from birth from their parents. So it's important to, co to compare like with like, to compare those who are exposed early to a language as their first language from birth. So we compare um, deaf who learned ASL as their first language to hearing people who learned English as their first language from birth. Now what these um, participants in the study were doing was naming pictures. So they were seeing pictures come on the screen and they were either producing signs or spoken words. So we could directly compare them. And they were doing this task while they were undergoing positron emission tomography. That is, this is a brain scanning technique that looks at blood flow. So when the brain, um, when neurons are doing in a particular task or engaged in a particular task, they need um, energy, they need um, oxygen, and so we can measure the um, flow of blood to those regions and see which regions of the brain are active when you're doing these particular tasks. And we usually compare this to um, a baseline type task um, to control for things like just visual processing of pictures or just basic motor commands. We want to look at those regions of the brain that are engaged in word production and sign production specifically. So when we did this group analysis comparing deaf signers and hearing speakers, we looked at the conjunction um, of word production and sign production. So what areas of the brain were equally active in uh, producing either words or signs? And I should say that this um, research was conducted in collaboration with um, two people who are now um, in the University of Washington community. So Dr. Tom Grabowski, who's now in radiology, and Sonia Mehta, who is now um, uh, graduate student in psychology. So what we find when we compare um, the neural regions that are engaged in producing words and producing signs is that Broca's area, this frontal region of the brain, was equally active, was equally engaged for both sign and word production. And what this is telling us is that the function of Broca's area is um, not specific to speech. So despite the fact that it's just anterior to the region that's involved in um, the oral facial articulators, and despite the fact that there's these very strong connections between Broca's area and auditory cortex, we still find that this region plays a really critical function in the production of a visual manual language. Now similarly, in, um, this wasn't a large group study, but in other studies that were looking at um, visual processing, comprehension of sign languages, so this time you're perceiving sign language rather than producing sign language, and they look at the brain responses for perceiving and understanding sign language, we find that Wernicke's area, these supposedly kind of auditory areas in the brain, are responding to uh, visual sign language which is suggesting that Wernicke's area is not um, specifically tied to auditory speech processing. We see that it's engaged when um, signers are comprehending visual sign language. So this is, if we go back to our original question, is brain organization for language determined by these input-output systems, by the fact that Broca's is near the speech area and Wernicke is near the auditory area? We can say no. These areas seem to play critical roles in the production and comprehension of language. It doesn't have to be speech. Now, another question that we can ask looking at um, deaf people who use sign language is whether there are actually any structural brain changes that are associated with sign language or deafness. So one of the things we've done is um, compare the structure of the brains of um, we have 25 um, deaf signers who are congenitally deaf or born deaf with 25 um, people with noring, normal hearing and compare in particular auditory brain regions to see if we see any changes that might be associated with your sign language or deafness. So we looked at a particular region called Heschel's gyrus, which is associated with, um, well, it's 
primary auditory cortex, so it's the first region in the cortex that receives input from sound, as well as um, a region called the planum temporale, which is a secondary auditory cortex. Um, also, um, it includes um, Wernicke's area is often part of the planum temporale. And um, the planum temporale has been found to be larger in the left hemisphere, and people have suggested that this might be because it's a um, speech-related area or a language-related area. So when we looked at um, Heschel's gyrus comparing deaf and hearing people, we found that um, there was um, no evidence that um, there was atrophy in Heschel's gyrus. So deaf people and um, hearing people didn't differ in the volume of gray matter in Heschel's gyrus, suggesting that um, these cells even though they're not receiving auditory input, don't die. We also found that uh, the white matter, that is, the tracts that connect auditory cortex to the rest of the brain, were smaller in uh, deaf signers. So we, didn't, we saw um, a smaller volume of white matter cortex for the deaf signers compared to the hearing, to the hearing non-signers, hearing people who, didn't, um, who could hear. Um, what this suggests is that uh, auditory cortex is maybe less strongly connected to the rest of the brain for deaf signers compared to people who can hear. The other thing we looked at was uh, the um, asymmetries between the left and the right hemisphere within both Heschel's gyrus and the planum temporale to look to see whether we see differences in the size of um, these cortical regions comparing deaf and hearing people. And what we found was both of them showed a leftward asymmetry, so larger in the language hemisphere, larger in the left hemisphere for Heschel's gyrus, as well as for the te planum temporale. So this blue region you see um, in the temporal lobe was larger in the left hemisphere for both groups. And what this is suggesting is that these asymmetries, the fact that these auditory cortices are bigger in the left hemisphere, is not driven by experience with spoken language, and it's also not driven by just general auditory um, experience. So we see these same asymmetries in uh, deaf signers um, that we see in people who can hear. So what this is telling us is some of the structure within auditory cortex um, is driven by experience, so the white matter differences, but we still see um, the same amount of gray matter, the same cell, number of cells, or the same, I should say, um, a volume of cells in primary auditory cortex for both deaf um, and hearing, suggesting that these regions may be responding to visual input. Okay, so what I want to do now is come back to this original question about what um, uh, drives brain organization for language and look at some domains where uh, sign is clearly distinct uh, from speech. And we're going to talk about two, read, two uh, domains. One is um, manual phonology, so the fact that for sign languages, the, um, articulator, the linguistic articulators are the hands rather than the vocal tract. And the ramifications of that fact, which is that sign languages often exib exhibit sensory motor iconicity, the fact um, that some signs actually look like the actions they depict. So, um, for example, the sign uh, for hammer looks like this. The sign for mop looks like the actual act of mopping. Now, in, in uh, English, there isn't any relationship between the word hammer and the act of hammering or the word mop and, and the act of mopping. Uh, Whereas sign languages, because they're these visual manual languages, they allow for the opportunity to create this kind of sensory motoric iconicity where the, the um, signs can actually look like the actions. And we want to know what are the ramifications of this kind of sensory motor iconicity for um, uh, uh, language organization in the brain. So first, I've been talking about sign language phonology or uh, it, how, can, how can you have a phonology without sound? How is it even possible to talk about sign language phonology? What could that mean? Well, just as spoken languages, um, words are made up of meaningless units that can be combined. 
So the difference between pat and bat is that first sound, the puss sound, which, and the buh sound, which in and of themselves doesn't have any meaning. But you um, swap one out, and you get a different word. And you change the order, you get pat versus tap. Well, that same kind of sublexical structure is found in sign languages. But it's based on uh, manual and uh, body uh, features. So signs can differ in location. So I can have the sign apple or onion. These two locations don't have any meaning in and of themselves. They're just contrastive. I can have the sign please versus sorry. Again, the hand shape makes the distinction. Children versus thing, orientation. Sit versus train, movement makes the distinction. And there are rules about how these different features, these different components can be combined. So for example, this kind of sign, where I touch these fingers, is illegal in ASL. It's not a, a well-formed sign, because this handshape doesn't allow contact on these fingers. In Hong Kong Sign Language, it's perfectly OK. There's also constraints on sequences of handshapes. So this is an OK handshape change from S to 1. But this is not allowed, and this is not allowed. So just as there are constraints in spoken languages on how you can combine segments, there are constraints in sign languages on how you can combine these units. Now, I want to make two points. One is that it's clear that these things have to be assembled in some way. Um, there's evidence from speech errors, actually, in sign language that um, people can make substitutions of handshapes and locations. So signs are not produced as holistic gestures. In addition, signs participate in this system of rules, in a system of contrast between different handshapes and different locations. Whereas pantomimes and the gestures that co-occur with speech don't operate in that kind of system of contrast or rules. So now, I want to come back to thinking about what impact um, manual phonology might have on the organization for language systems in the brain. So instead of looking at what regions of the brain are um, equally active for producing signs and producing words, I want to look at regions of the brain that are, might be different, looking at the interaction between um, the systems that are involved in sign production versus word production. So what areas do we find more activation for signs compared to words? One region that we see when we do this kind of contrast is a region in the parietal cortex called the supramarginal gyrus. This is an area that seems to be uh, more active for sign production than for speech production. When you look at um, studies of a spoken word production, you don't see this area off, um, active very often. And we wanted to look at, well, what might be driving this um, uh, region? What might be the role of this region in sign language production? Does it have to do with something about manual phonology, perhaps? And so to look at this, we, there's two possibilities, well, at least two possibilities, that might be um, driving this uh, parietal activation. <laughs> One might be that you're simply using your hands. So you're using your hands instead of your vocal tract. Maybe it's just manual art articulation. We know that the parietal cortex is involved in um, uh, reaching and grasping activities, for example. But it's also along this supramarginal gyrus is within that parasylvian language region. So maybe it's not so much that, that you're just using your hands, but that um, it plays a role in sign phonology in encoding uh, the phonology of a sign. One way we can look at that is by comparing finger spelling, which uses manual articulation, with signing, which I'll argue has um, a rich spatial um, phonological specification. So in finger spelling, the way um, you produce a word is by simply producing a hand shape for each letter of the uh, English word that it corresponds to. So you have fairly complex hand shapes because it's a sequence of, of letters, but there's no movement specification. There's no um, a location specification. It's always made in what's called neutral space. Whereas when you produce a sign, 
you have to produce a particular orientation of the hand shape. You have to put produce it at a particular location with a particular movement. So it has a much richer uh, phonological specification than just hand shape. So we asked participants to, again, do this um, single, word, single sign production task where they would name um, the same concept. So they were going to name animals. But they either named animals that could only be named with a fingerspelled word. So panda can only be named by fingerspelling. Or um, animals that um, only had a native uh, a sign, so rooster. Okay. So they named animals with signs or animals with fingerspelling. And then we compared what regions of the brain were more active for signing than for fingerspelling, or vice versa. And what we found was that the supermarginal gyrus was more active when signers were producing signs than when they were producing fingerspelled words. And what this suggests is that this region may be involved in the phonological assembly of uh, signs. What you have to do when you produce a sign is select the right location, the right movement, and the right hand shape, the right orientation, and put that all together in a package. And this hypothesis fits quite nicely with some work that was done here at the University of Washington by George Ojeman and David Carina, where they studied a deaf signer using cortical stimulation mapping. Um, and when they stimulated um, the supermarginal gyrus, what they found was clear phonological substitutions. In contrast to when they stimulated in the frontal region near Broca's area, they found more lax kind of articulation. But stimulating in this area, they found um, substitutions of hand shapes. So instead of producing a clear um, A bar type hand shape for the sign peanut, the patient, when stimulated in this area, produced an error with a clear X hand shape and produced this sign. So these data are consistent with the idea that the supermarginal gyrus is involved in uh, the uh, assembly of uh, uh, phonological pieces for sign production. OK, so let's have a kind of interim summary of where we are. What we've seen so far by looking at sign languages is evidence for both neural invariance and plasticity within the brain. We see that Broca's area is equally active in sign and speech production, which is suggesting that the function of this area is not dependent upon oral articulation um, or auditory speech perception. Wernicke's area and these auditory cortices respond to sign language input, respond to visual input. And we see that auditory brain cells um, are plastic, and they do not atrophy with congenital deafness, but they may be less connected with other brain regions. We see this reduction in white matter. Finally, we see a unique um, organization within the brain for sign processing, where we see um, that the left inferior parietal cortex, namely supermarginal gyrus, may be more active or is more active during sign language production. And we're hypothesizing that this has to do with the fact that signs have a manual phonology rather than an oral phonology. So now what I'd like to do is turn to a ramification of the fact that you're using the hands uh, for production and look at this unique aspect of sign language, which is the fact that um, signs sometimes look like the actions they depict. They exhibit what I've called sensory motor iconicity, where the hand represents the hand and the motion represents the motion of the object, rather than uh, visual um, iconicity, where it um, visually looks like the object. So it turns out that um, verbs that are called handling verbs in ASL look very much like pantomimes. They look like the actions that they denote. And here's a couple examples. So this is the sign for drink. and the sign for scrub. Okay. And also, signs for tools and for um, manipulable objects also often show this kind of sensory motoric iconicity. So the sign for telephone, in this case, the hand is representing the object. The uh, sign for screwdriver looks like this. Now what you have is um, an imitation of the kind of canonical motion of using a screwdriver you see in the sign for screwdriver. And given the fact that um, sign languages exhibit this kind of sensory motor iconicity for um, 
tools and for naming actions that um, are used with tools. We wanted to know whether or not that has any impact on the neural systems that are involved when you have to produce words for tools or signs for tools, signs for um, actions that involve tools. And before I can tell you about that, I need to tell you a little bit about the neural systems that are involved in naming tools for um, English and for naming tool-based actions like shaving or hammering. There are two areas that seem to be consistently active and engaged when hearing people um, speaking English produce these types of words. We see a left premotor area that's engaged for uh, naming tools. And one hypothesis for why this area is engaged is because this is an area, it's right near the primary uh, motor cortex for the hands, and it may store motor schemas for how you use tools. The other area that's consistently engaged is the left inferior parietal lobule. And this region seems to be particularly important for matching the hand shape with the particular uh, visual spatial properties of the object that you're going to grasp or interact with. So this prefrontal parietal region seems to be important for, in a sense, understanding tool use, how you use tools. You can think of it a little bit maybe as the, the embodied semantics of tool use, so that when you um, have to recognize and name tools or actions with tools, this is the system that comes online. Now, when hearing people are actually asked to pantomime to produce gestures for how you would use a tool, you see this prefrontal parietal region active as well. But in addition, you see um, activation in the left superior parietal region. So these are um, imaging studies comparing um, hearing people producing pantomimes um, in contrast to a low-level kind of baseline motoric movement. Now what's important is um, what you don't see active when people are producing pantomimes, you don't see um, Broca's area, for example, active when you're producing a pantomime. You see this superior parietal region as well as pr the prefrontal and the, the supermarginal gyrus active or inferior parietal region. One hypothesis for the um, superior parietal region has to do with planning how you're going to interact with an object. Now, when we think about what neural regions might be involved when signers are producing um, signs for tools or tool-based actions that have these kind of pantomimic properties, the first thing we want to think about is what regions um, might be similar. So, we um, hypothesize that the prefrontal parietal activation is going to be observed for signers because they have the same kind of semantics um, that, uh, the same kind of experience that um, hearing people have with tools. So we would expect them to have the same kind of embodied semantics. So we're going to expect to see this prefrontal parietal activation. But if these pantomimic signs pattern like pantomime, then we should see activation in uh, the superior parietal lobule, SPL. On the other hand, if these pantomimic signs pattern like spoken words, we should see activation in Broca's area, an area that's not active when, we see, uh, when you're asked to produce pantomime. So what we had participants do was we presented them with pictures of actions that involved some kind of object or tool and we asked them to then just produce the sign for those um, actions. And we picked these actions so that they would elicit signs that had this kind of pantomimic quality, the sensory motoric iconicity, so brush hair or erase, okay? So they were shown these pictures and then uh, asked to produce these signs while undergoing um, PET scanning so we could see which areas of the brain were, in, were active. We also presented them with pictures of <laughs> actions that didn't involve any kind of implement or tool or object. And so these were going to elicit signs that didn't have this kind of pantomimic quality, so um, yell or read. Now, if when signers are producing these um, pantomimic type verbs, if really what they're doing is uh, assembling a phonological word, that is, they're not creating a pantomime, but they're creating a verb, we should see no difference between the pantomimic type verbs and the non-pantomimic type verbs. They're both verbs. Whereas if we see um, 
that the pantomimic verbs are drawing on pantomime systems, we should see activation in superior parietal cortex, different from the non-pantomimic verbs. We basically have the same kinds of predictions looking at um, naming um, tools or manipulable objects that have the same kind of iconicity. Whether, uh, we can look to see whether these verbs are these um, nouns, pattern like the pantomimes, or pattern like verbs, or like uh, uh, signs, words. So the first thing we do, we can look at naming tools versus tool-based actions. And we see left premotor um, areas active for the deaf signers. And we also see activation in left IPL. So the um, peak coordinates where you find um, the highest activation in both left premotor cortex and in left inferior parietal cortex are nearly identical for both the deaf signers doing this in ASL and for the hearing people doing this in English. So this suggests that at least within this kind of semantic system, we see the same regions involved when um, signers and speakers name tools and tool-based actions. And when we look in Broca's area, we see for all three lexical types, both the manipulable object nouns, these pantomimic verbs, and the non-pantomimic verbs, we see activation uh, in Broca's area, which suggests that these are being produced as verbs, not as pantomimes. And when we directly compare the handling verbs to the non-pantomimic verbs, we see absolutely no difference in activation. So we don't see that the handling verbs are producing more activation in left superior parietal cortex. So we don't see evidence that these are being produced like pantomimes. So even though they look just like pantomimes, they're being produced like verbs. And this fits quite nicely with um, data from patient studies looking at signers who've, who've suffered left hemisphere damage and have become aphasic. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been at least two case studies of signers who've had left hemisphere damage who have uh, difficulty producing signs. So in given um, a um, naming task where they have to produce single signs, uh, they have a lot of trouble finding the signs even when they're very iconic and they'll substitute pantomimes. So in this case, they were um, trying to produce the target sign for airplane, which looks like this, and instead the patient produced a kind of pantomime, right? Um, so this is a case study from uh, David Carina, and not the um, deficit in uh, sign comprehension but preservation of pantomime, um, a comp well, I should say, let me get back up. Um, what we see we see um, a similar pattern in comprehension. So we saw impaired sign production and preserved pantomime. And we see the same thing in uh, comprehension. So um, good sign comprehension, poor pantomime comprehension. So in this task, um, the patient was shown a sign and had to pick from a picture. So maybe seeing the sign apple, which looks like this, and having to pick from an apple or a banana or grapes, or seeing a pantomime, so something like this, and having to pick the picture. Patient doing quite well in producing, in understanding the pantomime, but not the sign. This has actually been replicated recently with, um, a, by a group in Britain studying um, a signer of uh, British Sign Language, a completely different language from American Sign Language, finding the same kind of dissociation, poor sign, good pantomime. And they looked even further within the sign comprehension and production to see, well, maybe the iconic signs are better preserved than the non-iconic signs. Maybe there's still something about pantomime that's different or, or signs that look like pantomime. And what they found was that the um, signs that were very iconic, that looked like pantomime, were just as impaired as the signs that didn't, that were non-iconic. So we really see that there's this difference between uh, the neural systems that are involved in uh, signing compared to gesturing. But so far, we haven't actually done a direct comparison between sign production and pantomime production. If you ask somebody to produce a pantomime, the form of the gesture they, they produce is going to depend on the nature of the object that they um, are pantomime or the action 
that um, they're trying to pantomime. So if I want to pantomime drinking from a coffee cup or from a bottle, I would use this kind of hand shape. If I was trying to pantomime drinking through a straw, I might do something different. So it depends on the object that you're manipulating. Now for sign, if you ask someone to generate a sign, it's not going to depend so much on the object involved. So for example, the sign drink, just meaning to consume a liquid, looks like this. And you can use this sign whether or not you're drinking from a straw or from a shot glass or from a beer stein. This sign, meaning to drink, can be used in all of those cases. But you wouldn't use the same form for pantomime. So given these differences, we wanted to see, do we see actually, when we directly compare pantomime production and sign production, do we see differences in the neural substrates that are involved when you're producing these two types of forms, even if they look identical? So in this case, we had three different tasks. We had a verb generation task where participants, only the deaf signers, people who know ASL would do this task, where they were shown an object and they had to generate a verb that went with that object. Or they were shown an object and they were asked to generate um, a pantomime, how you would use this object. And we also had a baseline condition where they would see the picture um, and have to decide whether or not you could hold that object or not and make a response. And I'll show you what that looked like in a sec. So in the verb generation task, we had two types of pictures. One group of pictures would elicit these kind of pantomimic verbs, these handling verbs. And another group that would elicit verbs that didn't have this kind of pantomimic quality, so we could compare the two. So for example, to elicit these handling type verbs, we might have an object like this, a pen, which would elicit this kind of verb. This is a sign to write. or hammer. Okay. But these objects would elicit verbs that don't have that kind of pantomimic quality. So we ask them, this is the sign for measure. And this is, this is my personal favorite, the sign for uh, to pour, pour syrup or pour salad dressing. Now in the pantomime generation task, what we asked people to do was to show how you would use an object. And for deaf signers, we picked objects that um, would, if you were to generate a verb to that object, it wouldn't look like um, a pantomime, so that they couldn't cheat and just produce an ASL verb. They had to produce um, a, a pantomime. They were asked to produce a pantomime. And um, the um, hearing people had to do the same thing. Um, but we, so there was one group of objects that both the hearing people and the deaf people produced pantomimes to. We also had, a, um, we also had the hearing people produce pantomimes to those same pictures, the pen and the hammer picture, that the deaf people produced verbs to. So we could compare the deaf people producing verbs with the hearing people producing pantomimes. And those forms should look very similar. So here's an example of pantomime production. So the ASL sign for sweep looks like this if you were to produce a verb for the broom. But the pantomime would look something like this. And here would be pantomime instead of eat might be a verb that goes with this, but this is the pantomime to use a fork. <laughs> OK. And then lastly, um, in these tasks, you always have to compare um, the target task with a baseline task that gets rid of um, activation that has to do with visual processing and motor processing, and in this case also cognitive processing involved in deciding whether you can hold um, an object or not, the manipulability of an object. So they were just shown a bunch of objects that you could hold, and if you could hold it, you would do this kind of gesture, and you couldn't, you would do this. So that's the baseline task. So when we compare pantomime production for um, hearing non-signers compared to this baseline task, we see what's been found in um, other um, studies looking at pantomime production. We see this left superior parietal region active for um, producing pantomimes by the hearing non-signers. And when we look at the deaf people producing pantomimes, we see similar activation, but it's bilateral. So it's larger in the left, but it's also in the right hemisphere. And when we looked at um, what the deaf signers were doing, it, they were producing really 
pretty good pantomimes compared to the hearing people. Um, they were producing very crisp hand shapes. Um, they sometimes repeated the movement, and they would often produce two-handed pantomimes. So instead of just stir with one hand, they would show the bowl and stirring. So they were producing rather rich pantomimes compared to the um, hearing non-signers, which we think might um, underlie this difference in parietal activity that we see. We see maybe a, a, a richer or more integrated neural representation of hand actions for the signers compared to the non-signers. But I think what's really interesting is when we looked at the deaf signers producing these handling verbs, we don't see this superior parietal activation. What we see is a language area active. We see this inferior frontal gyrus. It's not quite Broca's area. It's just in front of Broca's area. But it's an area that has been found to be engaged when speakers do this kind of verb generation task, so when they have to produce a verb given an object. And it may be involved in semantic search or semantic integration, um, but it's clearly quite different than, what they were, than the pattern of activation we see when they were producing pantomimes. And when we look at what the hearing people are doing, they're producing very similar looking production, so write, hammer, they're producing pantomimes to the same pictures that the deaf people produce verbs to, um, and we don't see activation in this language region. We don't see activation in the inferior frontal gyrus. We see the same activation that we saw for the other group, that is su left superior parietal activation. And finally, when we compare the handling verbs with the non-pantomimic verbs, we see no difference in activation again. So these verbs are being treated the same by the brain. They're being treated as verbs. So what these data are telling us is that the production of pantomimes and ASL verbs relies on partially distinct neural systems. So when deaf signers are producing pantomimes, what you see is bilateral superior parietal activation. When they're signing, you see left frontal temporal regions engaged. The production of these pantomimic, iconic verbs and these non-iconic verbs engage the same language regions. So iconicity uh, does not seem to impact the neural systems that are involved for language. We see more activation in uh, parietal cortex for deaf signers producing pantomime. And this may be because they're producing these richer, more interesting, in a sense, um, pantomimes, which may reflect a more um, uh, integrated and um, broader uh, representation of hand actions for the signers. And the bottom line thing I want you to take away from today um, are basically two points. One is that the brain recognizes the distinction between language and gesture. And the brain seems to be organized for language, not for speech. And I'll end by thanking you as a great audience. And also, I think it's always important to thank the deaf people and the hearing people who um, volunteer to be in our research studies, because for the people who don't, if, if, uh, it's, our research would not be possible without these people who volunteer their time to be in our studies. And of course, acknowledge my wonderful collaborators and the research support from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you. Um. I was just wondering, you, you showed that there was um, the SMG activation during uh, sign production uh, that was greater than um, during spoken word production, and that you, you compared finger spelling to uh, production of an actual sign and found there was more activation for the production of the sign and you attributed it to the phonology. Mm -hmm. I assume you're, you're meaning um, that the finger spelling is sequential information and the, um, the sign language phonology is simultaneous information. Do you find that, er uh, so I have two questions then. Do you find that area um, SMG used for processing other simultaneous information? I actually think it's not so much that it's simultaneous information, but that it's information that you have to integrate with respect to location on the body, movement, and hand shape, as well as orientation of the hand. So it's combining all of those features together that seems to be engaging the supramarginal gyrus. So there is evidence that um, um, having to um, produce um, a, a 
uh, reach, for example, or um, other kinds of integrative um, information with the, with the hand and interactions with objects that engage that region, which may be similar to what happens when you've got to um, produce, move a hand to a particular location with a particular hand shape. Um, whereas finger spelling, it's really just the hand shapes. That's all that you're doing is, is sequencing it and putting it together. You don't have to move the hand to a particular target location or produce a particular movement. So it's not so much the simultane simultaneousness of all of it, but that you have to put it all together. Okay, um, then maybe my second question, maybe you've answered that. Um, so for the finger spelling, are there other areas of the brain then that are activated um, for the finger spelling? And yeah, do they have anything to do with spoken language phonology? Um, a little bit. So the area that we see um, more active for finger spelling is the um, supplementary motor area. And that's an area that's um, been implicated in speech production, in particular syllable ordering. Um, so it's, it makes sense that you would see finger spelling engaging that region more because that's what you have to do. You have to sequence the hand shapes. And the um, supplementary motor area is a region where they've um, found that um, you see activation there when you have to produce complex syllable sequences. A question on the other side? Over here. Yes, uh, you dealt with native deaf speakers. Um, I go to a lot of restaurants where there are people who were raised by non-speaking deaf parents who speak and uh, take my order. Um, did you do any studies with anything like that? And was there any, or have you just restricted yourself to native deaf speakers? So you mean looking at um, deaf people speak? Uh, the no. Uh, the, <clears throat> the people I'm thinking of are speaking hearing people who were raised by deaf oh, signing oh. parents and who had deaf signing siblings. Right. Yes, actually we've, um, we've looked at, at those um, signers. So they're bilingual, so they um, acquired um, both ASL and English. And we've looked in particular, we've been interested in spatial language. So we've looked at um, this group producing both English prepositions as well as ASL classifier constructions. In ASL, the way you talk about um, spatial relationships is by using these constructions in which one hand represents one referent and the other hand rep represents the other one, and you just place your hands in space to represent the spatial relationships. So it's a really different way of um, talking about space. So within these individuals, we can look at what they're doing when they're producing spatial language in English and when they're producing spatial language in ASL. And what's quite interesting is we see the stamp of their knowledge of ASL when they're producing English prepositions. So when deaf signers produce these ASL classifier constructions, we see right parietal cortex coming online and being active. That's a region that is involved in understanding spatial relationships um, in, the, in the world. And so when you have to use your hands to produce, um, to, to map onto spatial relationships that you're describing, right parietal cortex comes in. Now when these ASL English bilinguals are actually producing English prepositions, you see right parietal cortex active as well. You don't see it in the um, native monolingual English speakers. They just, we see left parietal activation for those guys. So what it's suggesting is that their brain is kind of processing um, information to produce, uh, about space um, as if they were going to produce an ASL, even though the task was to produce it in English. We had a question over here. Um, my question is, have you done anything with signed English signers, deaf um, people that their first language is not ASL but is signed English instead, and how the structure of English might change the structure of the sign language? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't looked um, at sign English per se, partly because there's a wide variety of what sign English is. So there's, um, at one end you have what's not really sign English, but more of a, a pidgin, a kind of contact language that's sort of ASL with Englishy kind of structures. At the other end, you have the very strict, 
signed exact English where there's um, a morpheme for each, uh, or a signed morpheme for each English morpheme, and you're really trying to represent English exactly. And the problem with that system is people don't really learn that system exactly. Um, so kids will change it if they're exposed to it um, early on, and they'll make it more like ASL. And so we have kind of a, a mush in trying to figure out, is it really English? Is it this contact language? So it's hard to know what the brain is going to be making of this system that's um, sort of like sign language, sort of like English, but not quite. So it's kind of a mixed system. Thank you.